Pacific Test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1 You will hear a woman being interviewed by a market researcher in a health club about her membership of the club. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Oh, excuse me. I wonder if you'd have the time to take part in some market research. Um, what's it about? About this club and your experiences and opinions about being a member. It'll take less than five minutes. Oh, OK then, as long as it's quick. Can I start by taking your name? It's Selina Thompson. Is that T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N? Yes. OK, great. Thanks. And what do you do for a living? Well, I'm an accountant, but I'm between jobs at the moment. I understand. But that's the job I'll put down on the form. And would you mind my asking which age group you fall into? Below 30, 31 to 50, and above? Over 50, <laughs> I think we can safely say. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thanks. And which type of membership do you have? Sorry, I'm not sure what you mean. Do you mean how long... Of no, is it a single person membership? Oh, right, no, it's a family membership. <laughs> thanks. And... How long have you been a member? Ooh, let me see. Uh, I was certainly here five years ago, and it was probably two to three years more than that. Mm -hmm. Shall I put down eight? Oh, I remember now. It's nine, definitely. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no problem. I've got that. And the last question in this first part is, what brought you to the club? Uh, sorry? Uh, how did you find out about the club? Did you see any ads? Well, I, I did, actually. But I have to say, I wasn't really attracted to the club because of that. It was through word of mouth. So you were recommended by a friend? <laughs> actually, my doctor. Oh. I'd been suffering from high blood pressure, and he said the club was very supportive of people with that condition, so I signed up. Mm, great, thanks. Before you hear the rest of the conversation... You have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Now, for the second part of the form, I want to ask a bit more about your experience of the club. Sure. Uh, how often would you say you use the club? <sighs> it varies enormously, depending on how busy I am. Mm, of course. But on average, per month? I'd say it averages out at twice a week. OK, so eight on average. Yeah, and four of those are aqua aerobics classes. That leads me to the next question. Would you say the swimming pool is the facility you make most use of? Fair to say that, yep. Right, thanks. And are there any facilities you don't use? Hmm. One area I realise I've never used is the tennis courts. Mm. And there's one simple reason for that. You don't play tennis? <laughs> Actually, I'm not bad at it. Oh. It's that I'm not happy having to pay extra for that privilege. Oh, right. I've made a note of that. Thanks. Mm. <clears throat> now, in the last section, are there any suggestions or recommendations you have for improvements to the club? 
Only about health and fitness? Anything at all. Well, I'd like to see more social events. Oh. It isn't just a question of getting together for games or classes, but other things, you know. Yes, yeah, sure. And another thing that I was thinking when I had my yoga class in the gym last night, we were all sweltering in the heat, uh, was that I think they should put in, or well, you know... Uh, Air conditioning. Uh, that's exactly what I mean. Mm. The rooms are really light and well-designed, but they do need proper installations. Sure. Well, I've made a note of that. Good. So, is there anything else you'd like to suggest? Uh, about quality of service, for example? Oh, everyone's very nice here. They couldn't be more friendly and helpful. Oh, but I tell you what, it's a shame the restaurant isn't open in the evening on Saturday. And Sunday as well, for that matter. Oh. So, the club should... Yeah, open it later on those days. OK. Well, thank you very much. That's <laughs> all the questions I have. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a telephone conversation about opening a bank account. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Expats Helpline, Terry Davies here. What can I do for you? Hello, Terry. I've been in this country for a while and I've just been offered a job in the city, so I think I'm going to need to open a bank account. I haven't had one before, so I'm wondering what papers I need. Well, basically, you'll need to be able to prove to the bank that you're who you say you are and that you live where you say you do, OK? Uh-huh. And for some banks, at least, that means you'll have to show them two separate pieces of identity. So I'll run through the list if you like. Uh, yes, please. OK. I'll bring it up on the screen. Let's see. Here it is. Right. The first thing it says is a valid passport. Mine's Australian. Yes, that would be fine, of course. The next one is a driving license. And again, one from your country would be OK. Then that's followed by birth certificate. Oh, hang on. That's only if you're under 18. Which I'm not. Right. So not that then. But you can also show them a benefit book. For instance, if you're in ill health or unemployed or getting income support? Yes, I could bring that. Or a letter from my employer, maybe? Well, that's not actually on the list, so we'll have to assume you can't. OK. And to prove where I live? Again, there are several possible things listed here. For instance, you could use a bill for council tax or something else for where you live, such as an insurance certificate. I've got one of those somewhere among all my papers. But what about bills? Things like phone bills, I mean. As long as it has your address on it, yes. Fine. So a bill for my mobile would do, would it? Uh, I'm afraid it would have to be for a fixed line phone. You could use other types of household bill, though, as long as you get them through the post. How about an electricity bill? That'll say where I live, won't it? If it's in your name and not that of a landlord, yes. It is, so I'll probably take that then. There's one other you might want to use. 
a vehicle registration document. If you have a car or motorbike or something, of course. No, I haven't actually. Now, I believe there's a bank actually inside the commercial centre, and I might open an account there, seeing as how that's where I'll be every day. Yeah, that would seem to make sense. I know people who bank there. I actually read about it in a city guide. My cousin picked it up when he was here a couple of years ago, and I made a few notes. Do you mind if I run through them with you now, just to make sure the details haven't changed? Fine, go ahead. Okay, first question. It's still a branch of the popular bank, is it? The one with links to Australian banks? No, it's actually been taken over by another big banking group, the Savings Bank. It still seems quite popular, though, especially with people doing business in the Asia Pacific area.、Mm. And when is it open? Monday to Saturday? I'll have to check their website for that. Give me a second or two, will you? Sure. Right. I've got it. Customer service, and it's just weekdays, I'm afraid.、Mm. Does it say what their business hours are? I'm just looking for that. It's on a different page for some reason. I think there's been a change at some banks in the last year or so. Yeah, here it is. It's open from 9:30 in the morning till half past three in the afternoon. And it's on the top floor of the main centre building, is it next to the travel agency? That's where it used to be, but they've since moved it to a slightly bigger place. It's on the ground floor now. Oh, and one last thing on this.、Um, I know most banks give incentives to young people to open accounts with them, but apparently this one didn't. Do you know if they're offering anything these days? I'll just check. I'm sure they'd say so on their new clients page if they were. No, there's nothing mentioned here.、Oh, that's a pity. I was quite looking forward to getting my free gift. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions eighteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions eighteen to twenty. There are plenty of other banks within walking distance. You know, it may be worth shopping around to see what they've got to offer. Longer opening hours, including Saturdays, perhaps less crowded. Can you tell me how to get to a couple of them? I know where the commercial centre is, so that's probably my best starting place. Sure. For the Royal Bank, you need to turn left when you leave the centre. Go along Market Street past the post office, and turn left up Bridge Street past the Shaw Theatre.、Mm. Then you take the first right. You'll see an internet cafe on the other side, and the Royal is just a bit further along on the right, directly opposite the Park Hotel. Okay, I've got that. Um, what about the Northern Bank? For that one, you turn right as you come out of the centre. And go along Market Street until you come to the junction with West Street.、Mm. There you turn right again and carry on up as far as the next junction, where you take a left. You'll see the bank from there. It's the third building on the right. Fine. And the last one,、uh, the National Bank. You can go either way from the centre, really, up West Street or Bridge Street, and then along past City Hall. The bank is on the other side of the road, right next to the tourist office. You can't miss it. Great! Thanks a lot for your help. Any time. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two engineering students. 
a woman in her sixth year called Linda, and a man in his fifth year called Matthew, discussing the benefits of student work placements. Before you listen, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 26. Hi, Linda. Can you spare a few minutes? Hello, Matthew. No problem. I just wanted to talk to you about temporary work placements. I've never really thought there was a good reason for doing one. I've got some savings, so I don't really need the money at the moment. But I've had an email from the university about a vacancy that looks quite interesting. You did a placement last year, didn't you? I did, yes. In my case, I wanted to find out if I was making the right career choice before I began applying for permanent jobs. I thought I wanted to work in car manufacturing, but I wasn't sure, so I applied to Toyota. What was the application process like? Lengthy. There were a lot of different parts to it. The dullest one was a psychometric test. You know, when you have to answer loads of questions about yourself. And you're trying to guess what's the best thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Then there was an activity that we did in groups, which I found really fascinating. Engineers are renowned for being a bit unsociable, but I thought we made a great team. And we had an individual task, too. We had to sort through various business documents and prioritize them. It was just like what you have to do as a student, really, just with different content. What exactly were you doing on the placement? I was helping to design some diagnostic software to identify any waste in the car assembly process. Do you mean waste of materials? No, time. Anything that can speed the process up helps to cut costs. How did the work placement compare to being a student? Was it hard work? Yes, it was. I'd had full-time work before. I've done various unskilled jobs during university holidays, and some of those involve long hours. So I thought I'd find it easy. I was wrong, though. I think when you're on placement, you're always trying to prove yourself. So you push yourself hard to succeed? Yes. But I got a lot of support from my employers. They were always helpful. And then, at the end of the placement, I was given formal feedback. Do you mean on your engineering ability? Well, no. I didn't really need that because we had team meetings every other day. And so I had the chance to discuss technical issues and ask about anything that wasn't clear. The evaluation was about general workplace things, like organizational ability, initiative, that sort of thing. I get the impression you think you benefited from the placement. Well, the best thing is that they've offered me a job for next year. Depending on my exam results, of course, but still. A permanent one? Yes. But apart from that, I learned so much. The industrial environment was much more demanding than the academic one. So my general skills improved. Like time management, meeting deadlines. And on the technical side, I learned new software packages, like MS Project. Well, I think you've convinced me that work placements are worthwhile, but... While you're here, can you give me advice on something else? Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. I'm about to make a start on the engineering materials module and I've got a book list here. Can you have a quick look and tell me what you would recommend? That's if you can remember. Let's see. I do remember some of them. Hmm. Yes, this one. The Science of Materials. I found the subject quite hard generally, but this book is very accessible, so it suited me. 
It doesn't cover everything, though. What about this one, then? Materials engineering. Oh, yes. I do remember that. But it's a bit out of date now, isn't it? Unless it's a new addition. I don't think so. But what I liked about it were the pictures. They really help to understand the descriptions. It's useful just from that point of view. Let's see. What else? Oh, yes. That one there. Engineering basics. I think out of all these, that's got the widest coverage. But I've looked at the contents page and it hardly mentions nanotechnology. Yes, you're right. The evolution of materials does, though. It's a recent publication, so it covers all the latest developments. It's a bit thin on the 1960s, though, and that decade was quite important. Well, it sounds as if they all complement each other in some ways. I don't suppose you can lend me... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk on bullying in the workplace given by a university lecturer to a group of students. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning. My name is Dr. Mervyn Forrest, and I specialize in management techniques and training. I've been invited here today to talk to you about the cost to the economy of bad management. And what I would like to dwell on first is an area that has recently been exercising everyone, and that is coercion in the workplace, or to put it more simply, bullying. It has been estimated that bullying at work costs the British economy up to £4 billion a year in lost working time and in legal fees. And with the problem apparently on the increase, it is time that managers took on board what is happening. I would like to think that what is perceived as bullying is nothing more than lack of experience, insecurity, or lack of awareness on the part of managers, and not a conscious effort to attack someone. But that is perhaps a case of, um, of my being naive or overhopeful. Before we break up into groups to look at the first task on the handout you've got, I'd like to give you a start with some of the main bullying methods that have been identified so far. Basically, what I'm going to do here is to give you examples of one or two points. Uh, can you all read the OHP clearly? Yes? Right, off we go. The first item on the list is giving people tasks which managers themselves cannot do and which are therefore impossible to achieve. This is, in fact, a very common strategy used by managers to manage their subordinates. It gives certain people a false sense of security as they watch others failing while they try to achieve the goals set. Another simple bullying technique is constantly moving the goalposts, especially when one's employees are in the middle of a task. This is not bad management, it is just plain stupid. All targets and goals set should be easily achieved within a realistic timescale. 
sending memos to someone else criticizing the performance of a task where the individual has no way of replying is another common technique, especially when the manager concerned does not reply or makes it impossible for subordinates to contact him or her by not answering the telephone or not replying to emails. This is not the style of a sound manager, but rather the antics of someone with emotional problems. If you behave like that, don't expect your staff to respect you. And now the technological bully. It is interesting how all tools designed to help can be turned into dangerous weapons. The urgent email bully is fast becoming a problem in the office. Employees turn on their computers to be faced with a string of badly worded emails, making instant and often unrealistic demands, which reveal the hysteria mode of management. Have you ever felt a sense of dread before looking at your email, even your personal messages? All companies should develop a company strategy whereby there is an email code of practice. With offensive messages being forwarded to a designated person for appropriate action, I would now like you to break up into groups and brainstorm other bullying techniques which you think you may have experienced, and perhaps, if you're honest, which you have been party to. I can think of at least nine more bullying strategies. I would also like you to consider ways in which you think that each of the techniques on your list can be countered. Is everyone clear as to what the task is? Yes. Okay. You've got twenty minutes to do this. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the test. You now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to your IELTS Listening Answer Sheet.